All right, everyone. Um, so I'm I'm Teras Minkowski. I am a CEO of uh, a consulting company, a DX consulting company called Frontside. Um, we we specialize in developer experience, and um, so, and we've been using Backstage for a couple of for more than a couple of years now. Um, but uh, we originally started when one of our clients said uh, that they wanted to build a portal, and then they actually pointed out what Backstage she was, and we saw it and we're like, oh, this is awesome. Let's do this. And uh, so since then, we've become a um, uh, a backstage professional services partner. Um, so we are an official partner of Spotify uh, in helping companies adopt backstage. And our prof uh, our majority of what we do is provide backstage support, um, uh, enterprise support. So we help companies build their backstage portals. Um, and so in the process of doing this, what we found is that um, there is a one common um, misconception that people have about uh, backstage, which is that uh, you know this idea that backstage is a is a platform, really leads people into all kinds of places because um, what people expect is that they'll be able to take backstage off the shelf and be able to just like turn on things and then things will just work and they'll be able to. Uh, get all these awesome benefits from backstage, which is true in many ways. But the reality is that because each platform is so different, you you can't rely, you can't expect for the um, for the platform or for, for backstage just work for you out of the box. Um, so I think the best way to think about backstage is to think about it as a framework, um, and it's a framework that we, you would use to create um, a backstage portal for your organization, and. The difference uh, in this is, is significant because um, a, a framework is something that's used by developers uh, to create um, uh, by developers, and the the framework has plugins, um, and then the result of that of that work is a product that um, that is going to be used by users, um, and so. Oh, like a product, um, unlike a, a framework, a product has features, and um, and those features are supposed to bring value to a user. So it's a different um, the, the a framework creates a product, um, and I think it's really important that um, you think about this when you're thinking about what you're going to create uh, with Backstage, because um, what you're really going to be doing is you're going to be using the features that are provided by um, that are provided by or plugins that are provided by backstage community um, and maybe sometimes creating your own to um, to bring uh, to create uh, features of the portal that are going to supposed that are going to bring value to the users. So for example, um, you know if you look at the uh, the software uh, software catalog, the feature that the the feature of the portal that the software catalog plugin provides is the um, is to make it easy for the users to find things. Um, likewise, with the backstage, uh, with, with the software templates um, backstage plugin, which is called the scaffolder, scaffolder plugin, um, the, perp, the, the feature that your portal will have that, that is provided by this plugin is the, um, is the ability to easily create new components, um, easily create new things um, on, on your port, in your portal. And so this is this theme kind of continues throughout. So like you know, with with the search plugin, it makes it easy for you to find the um, find things across the multiple sources um, within your within your ecosystem. Uh, Tech docs makes it easy to uh, write docs that are co-located with your source code. Um, the Kubernetes plugin um, makes it easy for you to see the it makes it easy for uh, users to see their services running in Backstage. So. This distinction is um, is important because all the plugins that are provided, what they do is they they provide the features that you will that you will deliver to your users, and um, and and the um, the portal, the backstage portal, is going to be used by developers to extract value that the backstage portal provides. So the your backstage users are. Uh, or the users of the backstage portal, they are your users. And, and the, the best way to think about them is think about a developer and think, what is, what is it like, what does a developer value? In many cases, a developer values um, 
the an ease like a developer wants to be able to accomplish more with less work or a developer wants to be able to um uh, to create a very impressive feature so it's the what um i think what's really it's really important that that we think about it from the perspective of what value can we deliver to the users because um because that's how you get real traction and um and the um and so if you wanted to get traction with your backstage portal i think the first step to really getting the results that you're looking for is um you have to ask your developers what what do they what do they need like what is what is going to be useful to them um and based on that information you need to like you know implement the feature in the backstage portal that is going to bring them that that, that is going to bring that value that's going to uh, allow them to do what they want to do um and then you ship this to the users you know you show it to them you get their feedback and then you repeat the process all over again so that's the typical flow um of um of building portals that actually get traction because the flip side to that is creating a portal and putting a bunch of effort in but because you've never asked the questions you're essentially just following the recipe that somebody else has followed but in reality those that, that recipe might not uh, fit within within your organization and we unfortunately see this very often because a lot of our clients uh, especially when early on they would come in and say can you tell us what your other customers are doing um, because uh, what they haven't done is they haven't gone to their uh, to their users and asked them like what what can we help you with like what would actually make a difference for you so um so if you're going to go out and ask the questions like these are the questions that you can consider asking and and um we can talk about some of some of the answers that you might hear um so we 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 do actually talk to our to our customers developers and we ask them um what we ask them what they need on our customers behalf and so a lot of what I'm going to share here is um things that we actually heard from developers um, and how we solve the how we solve the problem to to bring value for them that made the, the catalog actually stick within the organization. So a, a very common question is, you know, how do you find information um, about an existing service? So, you know, you're a developer, you work at a company and somebody says, oh, you know, we got to go use that service. And then you're like, well, you know, where do you go looking? And most common uh, you know, answer is like, well, I don't know, maybe somewhere in Confluence. Um, and so the the problem is that it's difficult to find what um, what you want. And so the solution to you know to this kind of you know not being able to find what you need is to prepopulate pre software catalog using entities using what you already know about the system. So as a, as an operator of the backstage portal, you can create an entity provider. So essentially, entity provider is something that extends the 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 software catalog plugin um, to read information from external services and populate the catalog so this gives you a way to um to make things searchable in backstage uh, without necessarily having to ask developers to go in and add all the all of the information in you know beforehand so um you know another version of this could be you know we, we have these services but it can be difficult to find specifications for these services so um how do we uh you know that's a very common problem is that you need to know how to communicate with a service but you but but finding the specifications is not easy so the a, a common solution to this is to um use a similar approach to what i described before is using an entity provider to uh to create re um, relationships between components and api documentation so um, you know, read an external service that might have information about API docs and associate that information with components in your catalog so that if a developer needs to go find service, like they find a service in the catalog and then they, you know, look at the, um, the API doc section and you can see the specifications for that service. Um, another version of, the, of an answer for this question um, could be something along the lines of, um, what is the um uh, another version of this could be you know um i will talk to one of my colleagues and ask them you know where to find that information um and we've actually seen this before where some companies like we had one of developers tell us that 
it's uh, it's very difficult to get anything done um, if you don't have a link. Um, and so uh, there's uh, one of their colleagues maintained a list of 150 links that they would need to use to access all of the different information within the organization. And so a solution in that particular case was to uh, use the Explorer plugin to make all of those links visible so that everyone within organizations had access to them. Let me see what uh, we had some. Um, okay, I will answer these questions after. Okay. Um, so, oh, a perfect answer for uh, for the next topic, which is the tech talks. So, um, so another um, another very common question that uh, you know you should be asking your your developers is like, you know, what are the docs like within our organization? Like, you know, tell me about the docs. And um, what you'll often hear from developers is that it's actually um, very difficult to find um, the docs that you need in Confluence. And um, it tends to be kind of mixed in with all kinds of other stuff that is not necessarily related to the components you're looking for. And so um, the way that uh, we've solved this problem in the past is to um, is to connect the um, essentially annotate the oh sorry uh, connect the confluence like connect confluence with with a search so that when you go into backstage you can use the search to search documentation in confluence so there's a mechanism in, in backstage called uh, collators so the search plugin has this mechanism um, where it allows you to um, to connect to an external service, so in this case, it'd be the confluence, and then uh, query for the information in that service, and then um, emit the information is going to be added to the index. So once that information is in the index, you can then search that information um, through Backstage, and it will when when it, when you find it, or, or when a user finds that information, it will link them to the confluence page where they can access the docs. Um, so let me at this point, I'm gonna, there's a question here. So what is the purpose um, or use of, um, of TechDocs plugin? Um, does it provide integration with Swagger or ASCII doc ULM, UML? So um, TechDocs plugin is a, is, is a popular plugin, uh, but the purpose of the TechDocs plugin is specifically to enable docs as code. So the idea is that you, um, from a developer's perspective, it makes it easy for developers to write documentation that is supposed to stay in sync with the uh, with the source code. And this is one of the um, one of the common problems that we, that we hear when we people talk about the docs is that the docs are often out of uh, out of sync um, or out of date. Uh, so the docs that docs often don't match either the the um, the state of the service currently. Or it doesn't match the um, the state of the uh, like it, it it was kind of a future state that was never achieved, um, and so the way that uh, the way to solve this is to use tech docs. So you, what tech docs allow you to do is to put documentation into the, into the repository so that when you change the um, when you change the source code. With that same commit, you can update the documentation so that there's always a um, the documentation and the and the um, and the code stays in sync. Um, of course, I mean that's something that whether or not that actually happens in practice is depends on your organization. So if you have if you have um, in your org, if your like if you if you if you have kind of processes that encourage people to update documentation. So like one, one of the things that we put in place with a lot of our clients is to say, um, if you have documentation that needs to be changed, like change that while you're preparing the pull request that introduces changes so that you don't have to, so, so that your documentation always stays in sync. And then tech docs would then uh, read, um, would then read the documentation from the repository and show it in backstage. Um, so the, and um, another common problem that you will see with documentation is that the information, 
the documentation is stored in some third party service. So uh, I think there's like, you know, one of them be like readme.io. Uh, there's a bunch of services that provide documentation, but that documentation is disconnected from the catalog. So what you can do is you can annotate components in the catalog to make it so that those components um, will have information about the external services. And then you can, um, then users can navigate from the catalog pages to the external service so that for every page in the catalog, there is, um, assuming you have the correct annotations in place, um, people can access documentation. And you can also use the same technique with the, with the first example that I gave. So you can, uh, what you can do is you can, if you have a service, it's something, if you have documentation, something like readme.io, um, what you could do is add the annotations to the catalog components. And then in your, in a collator, uh, query your catalog, get all of the components that have the annotation for documentation for readme.io documentation, and then go to readme.io and read the, read those docs and then populate the index. So that, that's a way for you to be able to make the, the catalog searchable from um, essentially like creating the linking to the external docs but and also making it searchable at the same time. Let me see if there's other service questions around the docs. Um, the there's one question here about the about um, search and uh, so is how does this how does the search in backstage differ from search and confluence? Um, well, one thing is you have control over how you populate the index. So the person who the operators of backstage, you decide what gets added to that index. So you essentially can, um, you can choose what specifically gets in the, added to the search. There's also a variety of different uh, search backends that you can use. So there's one, um, I think the, the one that gets installed by default is Postgres. Um, and you can also use Elasticsearch. So, uh, and you can tweak your search results um, in a way that's very specific to your project, which is something you can do with Confluence. Um, there's of course trade-offs between, between between all those options, uh, but the ability to just search the docs from from your backstage instance is a very popular solution with users. Um, uh, let's see. What if sales enablement teams want to access tech docs to decide product bundles? Um, that sounds um, that sounds like a great use case i don't know exactly how that would work but one of the things that we're seeing with a lot of um backstage adopters is that once they get the initial uh developer setup like so once once the initial setup for, for developers is taken care of they start thinking about how they can onboard other um, kinds of users to backstage because one of the um, one of the things that we see with Backstage, especially this is very visible with Spotify, because at Spotify they have the Backstage instance has been in production for, I think almost like nine years. I mean, it didn't wasn't the same shape as it is, but um, it is, um, it, it has been. It's a very mature developer portal, and so what's happening at Spotify is because it's it because it's essentially the place that you go to get your work done. Like if you want to do something within the organization that's not in your code, you go do that in Backstage. And that in itself makes it more useful to everyone because everyone has like everyone just goes to one place to to access the forms or whatever whatever they need to do at work they do it through backstage, and that that dynamic is is very healthy and very helpful um, because you can um, like the result is that at Spotify they have like forty teams that have contributed plugins to backstage because everyone essentially goes in and um, just adds whatever they need because they know that's the place to get things done. And so I think the idea of using um, of making information available to um, to sales enablement teams uh, through backstage is is a um, like a good approach. Um, I'm curious to what you know what that would look like exactly, but I think it's definitely doable. Um, and then so another question is uh, the last part would work with generic API doc from the Open API spec YAML. I can annotate to provide links. 
Um, I'm not sure about this last question, but uh, thank you. The last part would work to generate API doc from open API spec YAML. I can make annotate to provide the link. If you can, um, if you can clarify a question, I'll be happy to answer it. Um, in the meantime, I'll move on to the next section. So um, let's see if I missed anything here. Um, Uh, okay, I'm actually, so there's a question here from J.O., but I will answer that question later. I have a slide about this. So um, so another question that you could ask your developers is, how do you start a new project? So this is a really common, and this is a, this is a, the most, um, like this is a kind of a, a killer feature of Backstage because it's it it goes to support your golden paths. But the idea is that if if a developer, imagine someone starting, um, starting at a company uh, for the first time, like starting today and there's told, okay, well, why don't you go create a new service or a new um, a new website? Um, and uh, how would you go about doing that? Um, and so for many people, that would be like, if you know, if you're just starting the company, the, the answer to that question would be like, I have no idea. So, you know, the nice thing about backstage is uh, is that with backstage in place and using scaffold or template you could just tell someone just go to backstage and you'll see a list of templates there and you can choose from a list of templates and you can create the component that you want um but if the if they answer um uh, and the same goes for um a situation where somebody says you know like what's a very common thing to do is you know you create a new repository and you just go into the other into another project and you just copy and paste the code from that project into the new project well, all of that can be taken care of by the, by the template scaffold, uh, by, the, um, by the scaffold or plugin. So if you hear someone saying like we're copying and pasting code, that's a really good signal that you want you, you want to be using scaffolder to solve that problem. Um, another um, another um, version of this would be um, if you have to, if someone says, oh, um, well, you know, I do like, I create the repository, I put the code in there, and then we have to go and we have to register, like configure the continuous integration platform, like whatever that being um, Azure DevOps or Jenkins or uh, whatever it is that you're using um, to be able to to be able to build my project. Well, that's a really good sign that what you probably want to be doing is you want to create a custom action in your scaffold or plugin that will automatically register your repository with continuous integration platform when you're doing the scaffolding. So when a project is is run when when the scaffolder is running and is creating the the code from template, what you want you want to be able to do at that point is to um, make a call usually through the rest API to your uh, continuous int integration server and register, your new repository with uh, with that platform, so that when you push commits into your into your repository, it will autom automatically build your build your project and uh, according to whatever your scaffold of workflows are. And typically, what you would do is um, you would include your CI workflows as part of your template, so that when when the project is created from scratch, you it automatically is going to build on whatever your CI system of choice is at your company. Um, and then usually what will happen is like, if you get that CI building, then uh, what people usually end up doing after that, if they don't have any kind of automations, they would end up going to their infrastructure provider, providers um, web console to set up the project so that it, so you can start to deploy. Um, so, and this is something that you can do with, um, you can do you can configure this as part of your uh, scaffolder templates is so that um, developers can choose the choose the options that um, that uh, of services that they want to use and then when the project is being scaffolded from scratch like when you're creating a template if, like writing a template what it would do is it would create the um, it would provision or deploy or essentially configure your infrastructure for that particular service. Um, so that's a that's a 
a very common thing that we see, um, especially the companies that have a lot of developers doing because it eliminates the setup. In some cases, um, I've seen stats where uh, using this workflow, using the scaffolder templates to configure your, your infrastructure can reduce the, the time from initial, uh, the time to go, like to create a new service from scratch from like one week down to like 10 minutes. It's a really, a really drastic difference, especially if you're using something like, um, if you're using some kind of platform orchestrator um, that uh, can um, really accelerate things. Um, and um, there's also a new project that you, that you could check out called uh, score.dev. Um, it's a really, it's a, um, an excellent tool for including the configurations that, about provisioning your service alongside with your templates. So that when you when you run your scaffolder, your project is fully set up and is actually able to provision the necessary resources to run your service. It's really um, it's really interesting uh, technologies that are available now, uh, and it's used by a lot of big companies. Um, so let me then uh, okay. So then the next um, uh, let me actually take a look at what questions there are here. Um, uh, da, 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 da. How many people have actually? I'll, I'll come back to this question. So let me just cover some of the some of the things that we have here, and then I'll come back to the last question. So, um, so how do we see how do you see where the service is deployed? So, um, so you so so imagine a developer has scaffolded a new service from scratch. So now, so they have a repository, they have CI configured. They have, um, the, the, you know, the, it's deployed, um, and they want to be able to see, like, can I see the logs for that service, or can I? Is it did the service start? Like, how would someone in your company see that information? Um, and what you what you'll often like one of the options, one of the things you hear people say is like, oh, they're like, oh, we'll ask our DevOps person, like, to look to look at that information. Like they would look, usually they have like a CLI tool or something that they, they use to, to look in Kubernetes to tell us if, if the service is running. Well, um, you can uh, you can connect a your, the Kubernetes plugin to your Backstage instance so that when you, when there's a service running, um, you, a developer can go into Backstage, go to the component and see exactly what uh you know what's happening with that service um they could see information about the health of, the, of that service in backstage that that in itself is um can be really helpful especially for for people who don't feel comfortable uh using using a uh, platform tooling uh it makes that information available to them without having to go and ask a DevOps person um another version of this would be that um you know they would go to they would say oh i'm gonna go to a um, to a service in Kubernetes, oh, sorry, I'll, I'll go to a, a page, a Kubernetes cluster section of my infrastructure provider's web console. So like, you know, it'd be like um, Google Cloud or AWS. And then there they would say, okay, I uh, um, I can see that my, my service is running, um, but they would need to kind of skip, jump through a bunch of steps to get there. So again, this is something that you can do uh, with the Kubernetes plugin. You can actually just, embed that information into backstage so that they don't have to go to the um to another console to see their information um it saves them one step um, but it also in some cases can save um you know credential access restrictions all kinds of information can options that could prevent them from accessing that information um another version of this is like you know using something like uh you know searching in, in kubernetes lens lens so there's a so kubernetes lens is a popular tool for seeing um for kind of introspecting like what's happening in kubernetes um and there's a way to make this easier so you could essentially add an annotation to the to the component uh, to the catalog um entity page so that when it, when somebody goes to that catalog entity page they can click on that link and that um that link will take them directly to the page in kubernetes lens for that particular service um, that could be a, a nice little shortcut for them so they don't have to go searching in Kubernetes lens. They could just see, they could get a link right from the uh, from, from the backstage entity page. 
And this brings me to the really kind of big kind of secret sauce of, of Backstage. This I would say is probably um, one of the most important features of Backstage and the way that you can actually control what shows up in, in the catalog is by using annotations. So what you, you can, what you can do is effectively um, control what a user will see on the entity page by whether or not the annotation is available or set in the in the um, in the entity. So if you want the user to be able to see their logs, you essentially add an annotation that points to the logs, and then you optionally show um, in in you know somewhere in the, on the entity page uh, a link to those logs using that annotation. This is um, like this is if you can if you can make information available using annotations to developers, that in itself could be really, really helpful um, and bring a lot of value. And you can automate a lot of that using um, processors and entity providers. Um, so that's um, kind of concludes my slides. I think what I'll do is I'll go through and see what, what questions there are. Um, so there, there's a few that I missed earlier. So one of them is um, going with SaaS products is easy way or um, oh, SaaS products is easy way versus building backstage open source is worth it. Uh, SaaS product ops level. It's um, in in so so the question is like, is it worth building backstage versus using uh, versus using um, a service? I think I think every company has to evaluate that for themselves because. Um, there, and I should also note that there is Rody, which is a hosted backstage instance, which makes running backstage much easier. And there's also um, increasing number of uh, specialized companies that are like Tanzu, for example, uh, uses backstage um, and they're looking at expanding. Um, they include backstage as part of their offering. Uh, so that, and so there's a bunch of companies that are looking at making backstage more available. But in my mind, I mean, that, that kind of shows that... Um, Back, like open source, what I've seen long term, open source always wins. It's um, it's been a kind of a common trajectory. So, um, I think every company needs to evaluate whether it's worth to make the investment to build into backstage. But um, I think it's just going to get better and better. So, um, it's it's an investment that takes time to pay off. But you know, you, but it's a important piece of your infrastructure so being able to or internal develop platforms so being able to own that um, can be very valuable um so how many people have successfully asked the devs what they need most of the time the devs don't really know what they need um I mean, it's true i mean it's you don't um i think i think if you ask open-ended questions and just to ask them about um about the experience of using your platform they will tell you and of course like they won't know how to match those things to backstage features. You, it's something that you have to do or backstage plugins. Um, it's something that you have to do, but, um, but I know that, I mean, from my experience asking developers is that if you ask somebody what it's like for them, they will tell you. And, and if you listen, they will tell you a lot of stuff. We have, um, we have hours and hours of transcripts of developers explaining to us what it's like to be developers of their companies. Um, it's just a matter of like highlighting and extracting information that is useful and then knowing what to kind of act on. And we have a talk about that at Backstage Sessions for anyone who's interested, I guess, send the link of how we interview developers to learn about, uh, you know, what features to build. Um, so there's a question here, wouldn't adding annotations create additional overhead for external service docs instead of why not add as part of links? Um, as part of links, um, right. So the question is, uh, should you use annotations or use links? I think the the cost of using one or the other is, is the same. Um, uh, I think they have a different purpose. If you, um, and also the, the challenge about links is that they can be hard to notice. Um, with the annotations, you can, you, well, um, yeah, with the annotations, you can make it more prominent. Um, so, I mean, there, there are different options. I mean, it's not like one uh, links can be can be useful, but if you want to really highlight something, it's going to uh, using annotations can be really helpful. Um, 
but I mean, both options would work. I think the difference with the links, of course, is that the link, like once you specify the link, it just shows up. So it shows up in one of the cards. So that's definitely an advantage, but um, it's also um, it's also nice to have both options. And a, a lot of times also annotations are things that you generate programmatically as opposed to links, which is something that users manage themselves. Um, how would you implement managed services in Backstage where developer will also get updates for selected components in the future? How are related topics like uh, access control tracked? How would you implement managed services in Backstage where a developer will also get updates for a selected component in the future? Um, mm. I'm not sure I know the answers to this question. How would you implement managed services in Backstage? Um, where developers will also get updates for selected component in the future. It, it'd be great if you could clarify this question. Um, I don't know how, but uh, maybe in... Um, Maria, how, how do I get uh, someone to clarify the question that they have in, in the in the list of questions? Let's ask them, which you did already. Uh, and uh, I guess uh, we'll also be able to um, send over the follow-up. Okay. The okay. Um, there is, a, I should mention that for uh, access control, there is a permissions framework built into Backstage. And there's also... Um, Spotify is also in the process of uh, releasing a um, a commercial pl commercial plugin that will uh, allow um, provide like a, a GUI for um, managing permissions. So there's a whole bunch of things that are going on that I think will be helpful for for people, especially who for those who need to um, to track permissions. Um, uh, is automatic syncing. So another question is, is automatic syncing of code changes from the template owners to the template users possible? That's a really good question. Unfortunately, it's not possible currently. It's something that um, that we're looking at how to do. I'm, I, you know, I'm working with, um, personally working with, with some folks to try to find a way to synchronize um, templates. So the use case here is you have a template um, that you use to, to scaffold the component. Um, and so now there's code in the repository and then your template changes. How do you update the components with those changes? We have you, we, we, uh, one of the things we've done um, is we experimented with source graphs, cha uh, batch changes. It can be a way to propagate changes to a whole bunch of different components, uh, but there isn't anything kind of programmatic or automatic where you say, uh, you know, template is advanced. So now let's promote that change to all of the components that were created from it. Um, there's kind of two different parts to it. One prop, and I, I have an issue in GitHub and Backstage for this. So if you're interested, um, you can find it in the Backstage uh, issues, specifically about this, is like how to keep the, um, the templates in sync with, how to, sync the, how to sync components with templates when the template is changed. Um, uh, right. Uh, so yeah, yes, sir. Suggested that you could use renovate. That's an interesting option. I haven't I haven't looked at that, so I'll, I'll take a look at that um, in the future. Um, so another question they asked: We are a small DevOps team, not really trained in React, and we're struggling. Uh, what headcount do you require? Do you think is required to make change backstage successful? Um, that uh, so I mean the threshold for backstage in general is. 200 developers is kind of that's kind of like where it's recommended that you kind of take on this work. There's teams that have and um, for Rodi, the, the managed version, I think it's much lower. I think it's like something like less than 50 people, 50 developers. Um, and and maybe for a small DevOps team like Rodi might be way to go. So you don't have to um, you don't have to uh, you don't have to manage it at least. But I, I feel you on the React side. I mean, it's something that even, we, you know, we have clients who have developers 
who are working on backstage projects and they're also struggling with React and we work with them to help them, but um, it is it is definitely a challenge. And front side ourselves, like we're looking at how we can make that, how we can lower that barrier. So uh, DevOps folks who are not, you know, experienced in React, which is most of them um, don't have, you know, are not restricted by it, but it's definitely, it's definitely an issue. I completely agree. Um, so for small companies, um, I'd recommend just using template repositories. GitHub has, for example, GitLab as well. You can also template most of the tasks with the abstraction layer, like task file.dev. I'm not sure, I'm not familiar with task file.dev, but it's true. It's, um, the GitHub templates are nice. Uh, they're not as flexible, uh, because I think one of the nice things about scaffolder is you can, you can configure uh, like you can configure the forms and you can you can add logic and you can also configure what happens when the scaffold runs. So there's a whole lot that um, that um, scaffolder does that GitHub templates don't do. But uh, you're right. I mean, if you, you know if you don't have backstage, um, GitHub templates are are very nice. Um, uh, that's okay. How does Backstage uh, relate to other IDPs like Humanitech? Um, so I actually have a, so there's a question, how does Backstage relate to other IDPs like Humanitech? So Humanitech and Backstage both, they're actually not IDPs. Um, so uh, I, IDP is, is all the tools combined. And that would include, in many cases, that includes Backstage and Humanitech. So we have clients that use Humanitech and Backstage together very successfully in part because um, Humanitech takes care of the provisioning part um, and Backstage provides uh, all of the DX features. So like the, without Humanitech, like in the in combination of using Backstage with Humanitech, the idea is that your Humanitech is the orchestrator um, and the API that Backstage calls in to, to perform like platforms, to like perform deployments and platform specific operations. So they they work very well together. So and I also have a video. I mean, I have a video specifically about that. So I'd recommend for for, uh, for folks to look at. Um, we can share that link after. Maria, I, I noticed that it's three forty five. Is it okay if we go on a little bit longer to answer this the rest of these questions? Yeah, of course. If you have time. Okay. Uh, yeah. Video, so. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So um, so how would you add a platform orchestration infrastructure provisioning to Backstage? Would you recommend any tooling? Oh yeah, so that aligns really well with the previous question. Um, let me see if I can, uh, let me actually share a different screen here. So um, this is a, uh, let me see where it, um, uh, bah, 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 let me share this. Okay, so this actually is a really cool project um, that's um, the score.dev. Um, it allows developers to, so what, you can, what this allows you to do is you can include the provisioning information or you can include as part of your template, backstage template, you can include a YAML document that describes what a user, what, what a developer wants to provision for a particular service. So, um, and there is a, uh, I'm assuming that you can see my screen. Uh, Natalia, oh, sorry, um, Maria, can you see the score at that dev site? Am I sharing the right page? Yes, but uh, no, you see the, we see um, like the default page per se right now. Oh yeah, yeah, okay. All right, that's correct. Okay, so let me just see. Okay, so yeah, so there is, um, yeah. Uh, so if you look at, for example, manage specifications, so what you would do here is, um, if you look at this, so this is what a, a score that a score.dev file looks like. What you essentially have is a resources section that describes what resources you want to deploy, and you can fully template this because this is just YAML. So as part of your scaffold, you can allow developers to choose what kind of resources they want, um, and then Humanitech and others. So you, so here with this tool, you can actually use different um, different ways of con uh, parsing essentially the the score file to generate configuration. So you could use the same score file to configure to run. But with like with Composer, so you have a, you have a score file that you can use to run uh, Docker Compose, or you can use the same uh, score file to generate configuration with Helm, and then you can also do the same thing with Humanitech. So this is the um, this is what we recommend for our clients is to have uh, essentially in the source code of the repository 
configuration of what your service needs to needs to provision and then have an orchestrator uh, like Humanitech. Um, there's a few other options as, available as well. Uh, there's some open source one as well, like uh, Crossplane, um, something like that to um, to convert to essentially convert that um, convert the declaration of what your user needs into infrastructure that is running around that particular service or for that particular service. Um, and uh, yeah, so that, yeah, so there's also a suggestion of using uh, CICD. Yeah, so I mean, the other pattern would be is you have configuration file uh, that is um, that is read by uh, as part of a CI workflow um, in using something like Flux and Argo to deploy a provision. Um, so there's a question here. It says I just looked into Backstage mostly for application registry, not managing or deploying stuff. But it feels like a really, really a, a hammer for such a small fly. But I haven't found anything else to do that. Does it make sense for you to only use the app registry part of Backstage? Um, it absolutely makes sense to. So um, we have, we have. You can actually remove a lot of pieces. So if you only need the app registry, you could just use the app registry. I think when, when you mean app registry, you, you're probably referring to the catalog. Um, you absolutely can just opt in just use one part and just just disable all the other pieces um i actually something i wish it was easier with backstage just start with just one thing and that's actually how we recommend for a lot of our company a lot of our clients to adopt it is just start with one thing and then grow your backstage from there don't don't try to do all the things at the same time because you end up having a backstage portal that's half configured so it's a really good approach just take one thing and use it um there is uh for syncing you could use git forking um, Git forking, it it doesn't. I mean, merging branches. So I think the suggestion here is for syncing templates with um, with components. So when a template changed, synchronize the components. You could use uh, forking. The challenge with using Git forking is that merging code is very difficult. Merging branches is very difficult. So if you have two divergent branches. Um, that in itself could be really difficult. And it's um, people people struggle with, well, all kinds of different things, uh, but merging things is one of the struggles. It's one of the really difficult things in, in for, for a lot of people. So unfortunately, Git forking, um, in my experience, is, is just really hard for people. Um, or use non-jugs directly with backstage. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of different things to try, but I think one of the challenges is that there's not a lot of proven solutions that work really well. So uh, regarding the managed services, I think of it like this, a team primarily responsible, uh, a team primarily, primary responsibility is developing an application. Now the team doesn't want to manage their databases networks similar in the own. So I imagine you could offer these components packaged in backstage. However, these components will require main this at some point it should be responsibility of creative backstage component um i think that the way to to do that is what we talked about earlier so essentially uh providing managed services is you have a platform team that is responsible for infrastructure they provide they manage uh manage the services that are running on the infrastructure and then you use something like score to to allow developers to declare what they need and you can use the templates to allow developers to choose what they need as part of scaffolding. Um, and they can also, developers can also up, you know, add the things that they need afterwards, after the template was created um, using score file. And then the infrastructure team is responsible for managing and maintaining those services. And that split tends to be like a really good, good separation because the, pl the platform team needs to configure, uh, like the platform team knows um, they have ways of, like they, they know how the, those services needs to run because there's a lot of considerations like security, observ observability. There's all kinds of things that each service needs to be, each, each managed service needs to do to be like robust and running in a platform. So the best people to manage that are platform people. Uh, but what, they, what you have is you could have a kind of a contract between the backstage portal and the platform and that that contract can be in a form of something like score which is or or even a helm chart but some declaration of 
what the applicate what the workload needs, what the service needs, and then have the platform provide those things um, in, in a way that is appropriate for each for each environment. Um, yeah, could you please share a talk about asking developers the right questions to understand the needs? Yep, we will share that afterwards. Um, will Ansible work? I mean, I think Ansible is a popular option. I mean, it has historically been a popular option. I don't, I personally, I don't know Ansible very well. Like I actually never worked with Ansible. So unfortunately I can't answer that question. Um, uh, a lot of my work is on DX side. So there's a lot of different tools in the in the platform side that I'm not familiar with. And Ansible is one of them. Uh, I, I know about it in theory, but not, not in specifics. But I think that's um, hopefully will... Uh, but you know, someone who knows more about that could answer that question. I think that covers all the questions that I could see here. Um, yeah, I think we're good. I think we've covered all the questions. Amazing. Thank you so much, Saras. And guys, if you have any more questions, you can always go into platform engineering community and uh, Saras is hanging out over there, <laughs> right, Saras? Uh, yep. And uh, he'll be able to answer your questions, uh, either general, channel, or directly. Uh, let me just post a link to the platform engineering channel. Uh, other than that, Taras, thank you so much for such an insightful presentation, for your time. Thank you, uh, everyone who attended. I will send over the webinar replay as well as a couple of resources that Taras mentioned uh, in the follow-up tomorrow. And hope you have a great day. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria. Bye. Bye, everybody. Uh...